An apparent blow to a Chinese cyber espionage network. Microsoft has shut down more than 40 websites backed by a Chinese hacker group. The websites ran in nearly 30 countries, including the U.S. The U.S. says it won't send officials to the Beijing Winter Olympics, and some of its allies are now following suit. Brussels catches China off guard by refusing to lift the European Union sanctions. Beijing was added to the blacklist over human rights violations. The Chinese Communist Party claims China is also a democracy, describing it as a Chinese-style democracy. Alongside the remark, it launched a campaign to discredit American democracy. And does China have direct elections? The communist regime says yes, but some residents are reporting otherwise. Hello and welcome to China in Focus. I'm Evelyn Lee, in for Tiffany today. China's cyber spying network has taken a hit. Microsoft said on Monday that it had seized 42 websites from a state-backed Chinese hacking group known as Nickel or APT15. The group was likely using the websites to gather intelligence from foreign ministries, think tanks and human rights organizations. Microsoft received permission from a U.S. federal court to seize these sites. The hackers targeted the U.S. and nearly 30 other countries across the globe. Microsoft has been tracking Nickel since 2016 and analyzing its hacking activities since 2019. The company's vice president, Tom Burt, wrote in a post saying, there is often a correlation between Nickel's targets and China's geopolitical interests. Microsoft found Nickel's attacks used third-party VPNs or stolen credentials collected from spare phishing campaigns. Spare phishing is when hackers pose as trusted sources to scam people and businesses for personal data. Microsoft says Nickel's attacks are highly sophisticated, but the company adds there is nearly always one goal, to install unobtrusive malware that allows for surveillance and data theft. In less than two months, the 2022 Winter Olympics will open in Beijing. But the pandemic isn't the only thing casting a shadow on the event. A diplomatic boycott has been confirmed by the White House as a Chinese communist regime accuses the U.S. of betraying Olympic principles. Kyiv's allies are choosing their sides but seem to have divided opinions. Here's more. The U.S. announced on Monday that its officials will boycott the Beijing Winter Olympics, citing China's human rights abuses, including genocide against minority Muslims in China's Xinjiang region, though U.S. athletes are free to travel there and compete. In Beijing, China's foreign ministry spokesman said in a media briefing that Beijing opposes the diplomatic boycott and promised resolute countermeasures for the U.S. in response. He didn't give further details. Following America's lead, Australia has also decided not to send officials to China for the Winter Games. Canada, Britain, the Netherlands and Japan say they're still considering their positions. New Zealand noted it wouldn't send officials to Beijing, but added the decision was based largely on pandemic concerns. France explained there will be a coordinated action within the European Union to tackle the issue. While the incoming German foreign minister is the latest senior figure to float the idea of boycott. Despite their positions, the EU remains hesitant. In the face of growing calls from human rights groups, International Olympic Committee President Thomas Bach defended the choice to hold the Games in Beijing. He said on Monday that the Olympics cannot solve problems that generations of politicians have not solved. It seems Beijing may have misjudged Brussels. The European Union has decided to extend sanctions on Chinese officials and entities and keep China on its blacklist of human rights violators. The head of the European Parliament's delegation for China relations, Reinhard Bütikofer, confirmed that renewal on Monday. He says the sanctions will be extended through the ne end of next year. There are currently 14 individuals and four entities who have earned a spot on the EU's blacklist. Bütikofer explained that just days ago, leaders of the Chinese communist regime assumed that, that the EU would lift the sanctions. But that assessment was a miscalculated one. He says Germany's new government is also playing a positive role in the EU's approach to China. Germany's new foreign minister Annalena Baerbock has promised to take a tougher stance against China and plans to work strategically with its democratic allies. Butikova says the EU is still willing to talk with Beijing, but added that when necessary, it will draw a line. There is also another factor at play. 
The extended penalties jeopardized the Chinese EU investment agreement signed late December last year. That's because Beijing refuses to ratify the deal until the EU lifts its sanctions. The EU first posed the sanctions this March, targeting Chinese officials and entities tied to human rights abuses in China's Xinjiang region. Beijing denies the allegations and responded with its own sanctions on certain European parliament members, EU countries and some European institutions. Ahead of the U.S.'s democracy summit later this week, China appears to cast a shadow over the event, although it was not invited. Beijing issued a lengthy paper criticizing U.S.-style democracy while praising its own one-party system. Their domestic governance is messed up. The Chinese Communist Party took American-style democracy to task on Saturday. In a news conference, the party claimed that China has its own form of democracy. And the party says that its form is superior in a white paper titled China, Democracy That Works. In the white paper, the Communist Party praises the so-called virtues of its one-party model, calling it socialist democracy. The white paper says democracy and dictatorship are not contradictory because they are both to ensure that the people are the owners of the country. The CCP goes on to say suppressing the very few is to protect the majority and dictatorship is a tool to achieve democracy. The paper then sharply criticizes what it calls U.S.-style democracy, calling it a game of money politics and rule of the few over the many. The move comes just ahead of President Biden's Global Democracy Summit later this week. The summit invites representatives from more than 100 countries, but not China. The CCP appears to feel threatened by the summit, which it sees as a pushback against its political system. CCP officials hit back, saying the summit divides countries and points fingers at others. The White House slammed the criticism. Press Secretary Jen Psaki said the summit discusses ways to stand up for democracy around the world and, quote, that's nothing we're going to apologize for. Beijing is trying to portray its system as more effective than the U.S. model. But some netizens question if the CCP really represents the majority of Chinese people. One netizen says, at least one billion or so of the population likely don't belong to the CCP's classification of people. In China, direct elections are limited largely to the township and county levels. That's where voters cast ballots directly for their preferred candidates. But even at those lower levels, some candidates and voters claim their voices are being silenced. Residents in southwest China reveal what they see as the ugly truth about their elections, an opportunity to trade power and wealth. Let's take a look. Last month, southwest China's Chengdu city held an election for local representatives to the National People's Congress. But on Monday, some residents revealed major concerns about the authenticity of the voting process. One resident told us locals are only given the option to vote for officials she described as corrupt and those designated by the Chinese regime. She added that some officials also bribed residents for votes. To protect her identity, we've given her a pseudonym. The Communist Party faked the election. They wrote their people's names in as candidates. They selected their own people, and there were no official seals. Some voters did it to get 30 yuan in return, and some got 20 yuan. Others got 10 yuan here after voting for designated officials. I didn't go to vote at all. They were told which boxes to check, which names to circle. These people are corrupt officials who have been harming the country and the people. They crossed out the names of all human rights defenders, and none of them were elected. Another resident recounted a similar experience. Candidates here for the People's Congress election tried to get more votes, so they offered 10 yuan to each person who voted for them. And when the voters were given the ballots, the candidates' names had already been filled in. Lee says none of the officials, called people's representatives, helped solve local problems. She described how many houses in the city had been forcibly ripped down, leaving residents homeless. But when the victims went to officials at various levels of the party to defend their rights, they received no help or aid. Instead, authorities arrested the petitioners and even sentenced some of them to prison. What's more, another resident told us one of the election's highest vote-getters is an official who had been reported multiple times for corruption. A voting station in communist China can look like this. 
Two officials with rifles at each side of the ballot box. This is from Luying Village in northern China's Shandong province. The banner in the picture says election of the 12th Residence Committee of Luying Village. In China, some localities hold elections in order to show there is democracy. But the candidates are appointed by the Chinese Communist Party. People who run themselves and don't align with the party will be suppressed. A netizen mocked this election scene, saying, This shows vividly what full-process democracy is. CCP leader Xi Jinping created the term full-process democracy. He said Chinese-style full-process democracy is an all-round and full-covering democracy, and that it ensures the people's rights to know the true information, participate in the affair of the state, express their opinions, and supervise the government. Another netizen said this picture truly portrays CCP-style democracy, and that it should be sent to the whole world. Beijing may be throwing its weight around ahead of an election for the National People's Congress. Reports say local authorities forcibly destroyed the homes of several independent candidates in a matter of hours. Soon after, the destruction of property forced them to withdraw their political campaigns. Here's more. The practice of forced demolition appears to be alive and well in Beijing. According to sources close to the situation, the ministry in one local township ordered the teardown of three houses. All the properties belong to independent candidates for deputy positions in China's National People's Congress. The process also injured several members of the candidates' families. Running independently means the candidates don't have an official political background and aren't backed by the Chinese Communist Party. They include laid-off workers, students, and professors. The property destruction has largely been seen as a clampdown operation from Beijing. One property was demolished back in mid-November, the home of local resident Guo Qizheng. Video of the incident shows their daughter in the process of diaper-changing her two-month-old infant. That's when several men in black broke into the house and knocked her to the ground. Two women are seen taking the baby away, and the entire family was later detained elsewhere for 10-plus hours. When they got back to their home, debris were all that remained. The home of another resident, Li Hairong, was destroyed the same day. Both Guo Qizheng and Li Hairong had planned to run independently in China's general elections this year, used to elect MPC deputies. But both had been forced to withdraw following the damages. The timing of these forced demolitions has become suspect, as the incidents began shortly after 14 independent candidates in Beijing jointly released their election platforms on October 15th. A week later, yet another previous candidate, Guo Guijun, lost her home the same way. When workers came to destroy her home, her husband got caught in the crossfire. Several homes were demolished. There were no negotiations, no notices to move. Guo Qizheng's entire house was torn down. Last month, it was Guo Guijun. They forced them out, even got into their home and beat them. Guo's husband broke a bone. The demolition is large-scale. I believe the order came from high-level officials. NTD reached out to the 14 independent candidates, but none responded before airtime. How does it look like on site when Chinese Communist Party officials are trying to forcibly demolish people's houses? An online video shows a dramatic scene in northern China. Party officials smirk while the homeowner, who was not shown on camera, was shouting that the officials are trespassing on her private property. This is what the officials said in response. And the official eventually ordered the police to go in. The homeowner seemed to resist. After a while, the official started to retreat when a man appeared with fire on both of his hands. The man later caught on fire himself and fell to the ground. After he took off his coat, the fire was put off. The man eventually drove the officials away with an axe. A netizen on Twitter commented the demolition leader is smirking and the couple are defending their house with their lives. Reality is just like a tragic movie, even without editing. It makes people feel like crying.
We have more updates on China's Me Too tennis star Peng Shui. Her saga of openly accusing a former Communist Party official of sexual assault has caused an international stir. Many in the international community have taken actions against Beijing for cracking down on the scandal, but not all followed suit. Over the weekend, the governing body of tennis, the International Tennis Federation, or ITF, announced it won't suspend tournaments in China. It says it, quote, does not want to punish a billion people. This came just after it released a separate statement last week saying, our primary concern remains Peng Shui's well-being. Peng went missing for three weeks after going public with her allegations. Concerning her safety, the Women's Tennis Association, or WTA, has halted all tournaments in China, including Hong Kong. In response, Beijing attacked the WTA, saying China opposes the politicization of sports. Following calls to follow in WTA's footsteps, the ITF now clarifies it will not do so. But there are some who will. On Monday, Olympics German Athletes Group urged the International Olympic Committee, or IOC, to investigate Peng's safety. Last week, the IOC held a second call with Peng and reconfirmed her safety in a statement. But the German organization says the statement lacks evidence to support its claims. It also called upon the IOC to push China for assurances on the issue at the Winter Games. The IOC declined to reply, saying it had nothing further to say about last week's statement. But the IOC is now under greater scrutiny. A bipartisan group of U.S. lawmakers introduced a joint resolution on Friday accusing the IOC of aiding the Chinese communist regime in whitewashing the scandal. An alert for American citizens living in the Solomon Islands, be on guard. U.S. officials say the nation is in the midst of political unrest and warn that peaceful demonstrations may turn violent. And today's Juliet Song has more on that. The State Department is warning U.S. citizens in the Solomon Islands about potential violent protests. Thus, as many residents there are unhappy with the top leader and are looking to remove him from the position. Protesters took to the streets weeks ago, asking the prime minister to resign. Later, the peaceful protests turned violent, killing four residents. The Solomon Islands is the nation northeast of Australia. And even though it sits far away from the continental United States, it's a point of contention between Beijing, the U.S., and America's allies. That has to do with the island's location. An expert says if Beijing could control the Solomon Islands, it could isolate Australia from the U.S. and the rest of Asia. And then Beijing could further dominate the Southwest and the South Pacific. Aside from its strategic location, the Solomon Islands also has several deep water seaports, making it an ideal military base. Back in World War II, the nation served as a critical battlefield between the Allies and Japan. And it took American soldiers half a year to seize a major island there from the Japanese. The process was known as the Battle of Guadalcanal. This was a Japanese camp. It has now become a stronghold of American Marines from which they can clear the islands completely. And it was one of the turning points that shifted the situation in favor of the Allies. Another island under the Solomon Islands, called Tulagi, used to function as the headquarters for Japan and the UK when they controlled the Pacific. The Japanese used Tulagi as a base to invade Australia. Tulagi's strategic advantages have earned it a spot on Beijing's radar. In 2019, a state-owned Chinese company signed a deal with local authorities. Under it, the Chinese company would have exclusive development rights to the island for over 70 years. Even though the deal later fell apart under public pressure, the deal built up closer relations. Days before the Tulagi deal, the Solomon Islands cut diplomatic ties with Taiwan and recognized Beijing instead. The current prime minister, Manasa Sogovari, made the decision, a choice that upset many at the time especially leaders of its most populous province, Malaita. The country, Solomon Islands, uh, it, it will be like... Malaita's premier says he believes the country should partner with Taiwan because they share the same values. Because we share the same values and same respect. Uh, that uh, is something that uh, uh, we think is best 
for this country that we will affiliate with someone sharing the same values and respect as we as we do. What happened later was seen by many as a competition for influence. A year after the deal fell through, the U.S. gave Malaita a massive aid package, $25 million. But Beijing reportedly promised a bigger deal, a $500 million aid package, back when the Solomon Islands first made the diplomatic switch. The U.S. denies having geopolitical motives behind its aid package. External influence aside, tensions have been brewing inside the Solomon Islands. That's over issues like poverty, unemployment, and unequal distribution of resources. Weeks ago, violent protests shook the capital. Protesters marched in the streets, calling on the prime minister to resign. What started as peaceful demonstrations later turned into riots. Protesters set buildings on fire, and three bodies were found in a burnt building. Prime Minister Manasa Sogavari refused to resign. Later, opponents tried to vote him out of his position. They accused Sogavari of lying and using Chinese money to cling to power. The opposition leader says the nation has been plagued by unemployment and exploited resources, and that a prosperous Solomon Islands cannot be built on deception, insincerity, paranoia, state capture, and foreign interests. The prime minister maintains that he hasn't done anything wrong, and Chinese funding is important for the Solomon Islands' development. So why should I resign? The answer is very simple, Mr. Speaker. It is because I was elected by the members of parliament. Sir. The members of parliament represent their people. And our people elected me through their members of parliament. It's not the first time Sogavari has run into this situation. He was voted out of his position twice before. But this time, he survived the vote thanks to the backing of the majority of parliament members. Juliet Song, NTD News. In the British Senate, House of Lords on Monday, questions pointed to a national security review into the takeover of the UK's largest microchip plant. Chinese-owned firm Nexperia bought Newport Wafer Fab in the summer. In that they have a clear strategy of undermining resilience and security, of promoting dependency, <coughs> of e acquiring intellectual property and data, of destroying competitiveness through slave labor in everything from green energy through to surveillance equipment made in places like Xinjiang, which the <coughs> foreign secretary has called a, a slave state practicing genocide. The Chinese have made a huge effort to gain intellectual property over a number of years. I had to go and warn them about this way back at the end of the 90s, and they paid no attention then, and they've got, they're doing it now more and more and more. The, the hardly a week goes by without uh, uh, the semiconductor shortage impacting some of our businesses in this country. So it's not just about security, it's about manufacturing. Parliamentary Under Secretary of State Lord Callanan said he couldn't comment on the review of the takeover as it was still underway. But he did say he shares the concerns over the appalling human rights abuses committed by China's communist regime. The parliamentary question was raised by Lord Alton. That's all for today. And before you go, here's a short glimpse into this Wednesday's special report. Some say future wars will be defined by artificial intelligence. Whichever nation harnesses AI first will have a decisive advantage on the battlefield for many, many years. And China may be edging closer to gaining the upper hand. If we don't take a stand now and take action, we have no fighting chance in succeeding uh, 10 to 15 years from now. So how far has China gotten in developing its AI? Why are they advancing so fast? What could losing the AI race with China really mean for the US and the free world? And what is the Chinese Communist Party's ultimate goal? We explore these questions and more in our latest special report.